In order to learn how to code, we need to learn how to think like a developer. There are actually a lot of misconceptions about what it means to learn how to code in terms of preparation, skills required, abilities, and even methodology. Um, so we need to break that down to set you up for success and get you to start thinking like a developer. This course is gonna be pretty different from some of the ones you've seen online. And there's a few different reasons for this, but one of them is that I focus so heavily on the mindset required in order to succeed in learning how to code. And it's a course geared towards network engineers if you didn't already watch the course introduction previously. People do not fail to learn how to code because they can't learn a specific language like Python or C-sharp or Java. They fail to learn how to code, A, because they don't commit to practicing, but B, because they don't ever learn how to think like a developer. And that's not their fault. We don't do a good job of teaching it. So the first mindset shift that we need before we dive further into learning how to code is to understand that learning to code is a skill like learning to read. Think back to your childhood and how long, how many years it took you not just to learn how to read, but how to learn to read at a certain level, right? You spent most of your childhood gaining those skills, starting out with just sounding out letters and knowing the alphabet, all the way up to recognizing sight words, um, putting together sentences, and then comprehending chapter books. Coding is the same thing. We like to pretend in the industry that you have to be some sort of genius, that it has to come naturally to you etc. But just like we expect everyone can learn how to read, anybody can learn how to code. We just need to do a better job of supporting folks in doing that. So going into this, know that you are starting a journey. And I am here to ramp you up as quickly as possible so that it's more fun for you. But your skill and expertise will grow as you stick with it and practice. The second mindset shift that we need to keep in mind is the fact that there's a reason that coding is so hard to learn. And yes, the lack of great education, in my opinion, is part of that. But the other reason it's so hard is because you're using parts of your brain that you're not used to using. It's not in your head that this feels so out there when you're trying to code something or, or solve a problem. And that is because researchers have found that although we are using a programming language, it uses the language system some, but not consistently. Um, a lot of people like to say that it's all math and spatial reasoning. And researchers have found that it's definitely not spatial reasoning either. It's actually the multiple demand network, which relies on general reasoning, logic, and some mathematical thinking is what is most strongly active when you are coding. And different parts of your brain are active depending on what kinds of things you are doing while coding. So this is a huge deal because if we're not used to using our brain in certain ways or using it to solve certain types of problems, it's going to be a little bit tiring and difficult initially to learn how to do something with those parts of the brain, right? So again, what's key here is being patient and understanding that you are literally exercising a muscle and screw anybody who says that it needs to come naturally. They don't know what they're talking about. The third and final mindset shift or tip that I need to tell you about before you get started so that you may think like a developer is to teach you uh, the logic that we rely on as developers in order to solve problems. So we talked about how, you know, we're solving problems in ways that we typically aren't in real life or in other areas of our life. And please don't be scared that I mentioned that, oh, you know, there's some mathematical reasoning parts of the brain involved. Um, it's actually not as math heavy to do most types of coding as people think. Obviously there is software everywhere and there's lots of different types of coding. And so please know that there are highly math involved developer or coding jobs out there. However, for network automation, right? You don't need to be some sort of math whiz. You need to understand logic. And as somebody who is not the best at math for sure, and always considered myself more of a language person and writer, um, I thrived learning logic. I found it much easier. And a lot of that logic can be learned along the way during your journey, right? You don't need to be intimidated by that either. But I just want to give you a few examples of the types of logic you're going to encounter because I want to start, you know, greasing the uh, brain gears here uh, to think in the way you need to to solve different problems. Okay, The logic of programming is primarily found in discrete mathematics. Again, I got a C on every single exam in that course, yet I love what I learned and I know how to code. So again, don't be worried. <laughs> so in order to give you just a base level of logic for you to approach your coding journey, we are going to talk about sets. We're going to briefly define algorithms. 
We'll introduce graph theory. Again, this is not as scary as it sounds. And if I have time before my 20 minutes are up, we're going to talk about the concept of having outputs or no outputs when, when doing something. It's called finite state machine. So logic concept number one, a set. A set is an unordered collection of objects. This, this just means it's a collection of things whose order doesn't matter. You could put one before the other, right? I wanna give you an example. Let's pretend that you have a bunch of IP addresses, right? Let's say you've got like 192.168.1.4 and then 192.168.1.17. And you have this collection of IP addresses, right? Maybe they're all on the same subnet, but the order of them doesn't necessarily matter when you're storing them, right? You just wanna put them all in the same place. This is a concept that you can use when solving problems, right? Let's pretend that you see an IP address come in and you want to check whether or not it's in this set, right? Because maybe you only want to perform a certain action on IP addresses in a certain subnet. This is a concept you could use in order to solve that kind of problem. If this IP address is part of this group, then do this. If not, do that. In coding, there are built-in ways to, to create these sets. And there's also variations of this, like where the order might matter. Take, for instance, maybe you have put a list of your access control rules for your firewall. The order of that list does matter because that is the order in which those rules are applied against network traffic. So the order of those does matter and it would be in a collection of objects that is ordered called a list. Logic concept number two is the concept of an algorithm. This is a big scary word that we throw around today, but all it means is that it's a set of instructions used to solve a problem. And obviously it's used to solve a problem by a computer. You're typically going to have an input, something that goes into the algorithm, and then you're gonna have an output, which is what you want the algorithm to give back. So here's a very simple example. Let's pretend that you have written an algorithm to add two numbers together, right? So the input would be the two numbers that you receive, right? Maybe you receive them um, as a form on a website. Maybe someone's directly typing them into the terminal, whatever, you're receiving them somehow. The algorithm will add those two inputs and it will spit out an output, which is the sum. So if you're given one plus one, the output is going to be two. Now there are infinite possibilities to apply this algorithmic logic to networking. And honestly, we need you guys' help to figure out what those are because you're the domain experts. Here's an example. Let's pretend that you get an input of some sort of log, some log reading that says, I don't know, a link is down or something. So you get this input, a link is down through your logs and maybe your algorithm troubleshoots why the link is down or it just brings the link up and then it outputs the result. That's one potential example. Again, there are a million. In one of the more recent scripts or pieces of code that I wrote, I wrote something that took all of the URLs or domains that were seen on a network in the past week um, and I compared it to the top million most common domains seen on the internet and then outputted the difference between those two things so that people knew what kind of uncommon or you know unfamiliar strange domains were seen on their network. That is an example of an input and an output. You don't need to be like, ah, genius, a guru at these concepts. I'm just exposing them to you so that you're not going into this like Bambi with, with big deer in the headlight look. Personally, I found that learning logic in first learning how to code was a little bit mentally exhausting because of this new way of problem solving, but it can be fun. And don't worry, we're going to learn exactly how to take an input uh, how to write instructions to do what you want, and then how to get that output that you are desiring. But again, at least you know those are the terms that we're thinking in as developers. And again, again, this is exposure therapy. This is not, oh, okay, now I understand what an algorithm is. The third and final logic concept that I want to introduce to you is graph theory. And this is actually probably not new to you as a network engineer. You just maybe didn't realize that what you learned was graph theory. Daniel Dibb, who is a senior architect, CCIE, CCDE, and a respected member of the network engineering community, recently wrote a really great LinkedIn post about uh, the ISIS protocol, which is a routing protocol, and how understanding it requires understanding graph theory. This is because graph theory is the logic behind what path someone should take based on the weight assigned to it or the number assigned to it. OSPF, BGP, Spanning Tree Protocol, and a number of network security uh, concepts rely on graph theory. 
So I'm going to use the simplest example that I can think of, even though it's not networking related. Let's pretend that you want to go get coffee from your house and you want to know what the shortest or most efficient route to your favorite coffee shop is. So we would represent your house and the coffee shop as two little circles. And those we call nodes in graph theory, these destinations, these places are nodes. Then we can draw various lines to get from the house to the coffee shop. Maybe these are lines where you're taking different paths on a road. Maybe you're driving through people's yards. Um, but regardless, right, we can draw multiple lines or paths. And these paths are referred to as um, edges. These paths can also have direction and weight assigned to them. So as an example, maybe one of the paths you're taking is actually just a one-way road to your coffee shop. Maybe you can't take it the way back too. So it would just have an arrow pointing towards the coffee shop. Um, again, we can have weights assigned. So maybe it takes uh, five minutes for you to take uh, Highway 57 to the coffee shop, but maybe it takes you 37 minutes to take Highway 54 to the coffee shop. Well, you would use that in an algorithm to decide what is the best path to take or the most efficient path to take. Just like you do with routing protocols when deciding the most efficient path to take on a network. My husband just brought me hot chocolate. He's so nice. <laughs> okay, so you have been exposed to some of the logical ways of thinking that we use when solving problems, coding. And to be honest, even with just those concepts, there's quite a lot you can solve and we're going to practice it. I'm going to practice how you can apply it to network engineering. We're gonna practice how you write it in code, um, but we have a lot of other baby steps to get to before we do any of that. So thank you so much for sticking with this, for committing to thinking in a brand new way that can be intimidating, but know that anyone can learn it. If you learned how to read, you can learn how to code. So make sure that you do the practice exercises that are included with this uh, video. It's linked in the description. There's also an evaluation guide for a trusted person in your life to evaluate your understanding. If you don't want have one, you can use me. I just may not respond quickly, depends. Once you've completed those practice exercises, which I keep short and you have gotten the assessment done to make sure, hey, I understood these concepts. Um, you can move on to the next video where we are going to set up our developer environment. If you have any questions on any of these videos, including this one, please let me know in the comments. Also let me know, do you want additional examples of anything? Do you need further clarification? This is version one of this course and I wanna make sure that you learn to code for real this time. So take care, I'll see you in the next video.